I'm here with Michelle Lugy, artist in residence for the town of Arlington. We're doing a Zoom call because we're in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic and therefore can't gather. But we wanted to just have a conversation about the artist in residence project that we are organizing here in Arlington so people could learn a little bit more about Michelle and her work and the project as it's been unfolding. So Michelle, I just want to start by asking you about your work. I know that you've, um, you're an accomplished ceramic artist, you draw, you paint, you can work in a lot of different media, um, but recently you've been focusing on using plastic bags as your medium. Why, how did this start? What prompted you to do this? Well, about uh, 12 years ago now, I learned about the plastic debris floating in the ocean and it's basically a plastic soup out there and of course it's getting uh, more filled with plastic all the time as we continue to produce more and more plastic. Um, and at about the same time I learned that I could um, process plastic bags to make a plastic yarn and crochet with that plastic. So I put those two ideas together and um, started to create recognizable ocean creatures out of um, post-consumer plastic. And uh, from there, uh, the recognizable creatures were a bit too um, prescribed and accessible for me. So from there, I started to look at more microscopic imagery. And um, I also have a group of terrestrial work where um, I'm using a brown plastic bag that really mimics colors in nature. and um, created some forms from those pieces as well. Can you talk a little bit more about how you learned about microplastics specifically and the impact of microplastics on the oceans, on the health of the oceans? Because I think a lot of people think right away, oh yeah, I've seen photographs of that milk jug at the bottom of the ocean or that plastic bag swirling through the river. But it's really, there's really another problem going on. Right, well you think, you think plastic, um, oh, it's, you know, doesn't biodegrade, it's going to be around forever. And you think of the milk jug, but actually um, plastic doesn't biodegrade, but it photodegrades. So the plastic is continually breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces. And those pieces um, become, you know, the same size as the marine life source, the marine food sources. So uh, it starts to uh, choke out the actual marine food sources. So that's when I started to think about what, you know, I started to create um, microscopic ocean creatures like dinoflagellate, which is a um, marine food source, and then look at other, those sort, the structures of those forms are really incredibly sculptural and beautiful and unique. And so I started to um, really look at those. And then, and that, it feels to me like actually anything could be down there out there and the um, imagery then sort of opens up to my interpretation and they also have this sort of otherworldly quality um, which I really appreciate for my work. So it sounds like the um, the shapes that you're working with now are partially based on research and partially partially based on imagination. I think that's true, yeah. <laughs> and what, Sometimes closer than others. <laughs> and what are some of the um, references that you use for research? Uh, well, I've looked a lot at the work of Ernst Haeckel, and um, I recently went to a, a um, lecture by the Terra Ocean, uh, I can't remember exactly the name, but it was a, a marine vessel that went out and started sampling deep ocean waters. Um, picking up all these really incredibly diverse, um, tiny uh, ocean creatures and in all their um, sort of really interesting uh, forms. So um, I look a lot at both of those. So are these creatures that you need a microscope to observe or are they visible by eye, by eyesight? I think you need a microscope to observe them. So you're really uh, kind of bringing into our space an invisible world. I would say that's true. It's not, it's probably not strictly true, but um, definitely that is, um, you know, probably 80% of my uh, imagery sources. 
So for the residency in Arlington, you're developing a piece for a section of the Minuteman Bikeway in the cultural district in Arlington. So we're dealing with a town. It's not near the ocean. What's inspiring your imagery here for this project? Well, many of those um, same microscopic, maybe not exactly the same, but those same microscopic forms are present in freshwater as well. Dinoflagellates, um, I can't remember the names off the top of my head. I'm not a biologist, but um, really also interesting and you know funky and cute sort of little <laughs> critters um, that uh, I enjoy working with. And they you know um, kind of lend themselves to my sort of, um, I think I like for my work to take on an animated quality and all of those little creatures kind of do that for me. So in this case, we're thinking these might be some of the creatures that live in Spy Pond? Exactly. Uh -huh. So as part of your residency, you've done, you've put up wonderful installations in the Fox Library and also at the Roasted Granola Cafe in Arlington Heights so people can have a very concrete idea of what your sculpture is like. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between doing an installation in an inside space, like gallery or a cafe or library, any kind of inside space versus a public space, an outdoor space where there's a different scale and there are trees and bushes and how are, how are you approaching that shift? Right, well, I do think the main difference is scale that, um, and I'm, I'm I've, I have installed outside, but like singular larger pieces where I can really, I've been able to really place them and site them in areas where I feel they'll be visible. Um, so the uh, Minuteman bike path is, offers a, a little bit different challenge to be installing a whole group of pieces and possibly in um, separate areas along the bike path. And so, um, yeah, I think scale and also preparing for the um, and the elements. So um, I do uh, coat my work. I so I crochet with plastic. Then I put a wire structure inside, and then I um, put an o a UV resin over the outside to protect from um, UV rays, which will break down the plastic. So one of the goals of our residency, since you're working in a public space, is to enlist a lot of people in helping you to fabricate your sculpture. Um, you have a lot of experience teaching in both in college level at Leslie and in community spaces. Um, but I'm curious what it's like in Arlington where we've purposely been engaging people of different ages and different interests. We've got You've been, you've been meeting with fifth graders, you've met with middle school students, you've uh, met with Arlington, local Arlington artists through art links, through a special workshop with, with them. You've gone to the Council on Aging. Um, you're working with experienced crocheters, you're working with beginners and people who are just curious and decided to stop by the Fox Library and take a workshop. Also, people who are coming because they're environmental activists, they uh, heard about a workshop through Sustainable Arlington, through the outreach that they're doing. What's it like to work with all these different kinds of people who bring their different interests? Well, the response from the whole Arlington community has really been amazing, overwhelming, um, positive, and I've been just so excited for the feedback and to be able to kind of link community members together and we've enlisted this whole group of mentors for the workshops and uh, so it's so nice to see you know the community people helping each other um, figure things out and and also you know um, the association with the libraries and um, all of the uh, wonderful partners that you have put together <laughs> which is uh, i think really an important and amazing part of the project, it wouldn't really be able to happen without all of those, um, that outreach and that network that you've created. Well, I know that for me, part of the reason that I thought you would be a wonderful person to bring to Arlington is that there is such a strong environmental community here. Residents of the town are really concerned uh, about the environment, have done a lot of work, to even say, to raise money to um, do restoration work at Spy Pond at our site. 
um, and the community has banned plastic bags. Um, so it was a really good fit from that point of view, and it's been very organic and natural enlisting support from folks and participation. I'm curious if you've learned anything from any of the people who come to workshops. I know we've had some people who are probably knowledgeable about the environmental issues. Have, have you found, and there have also been folks who are knowledgeable about the crocheting craft. Have you been learning from participants at all? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't actually, my crochet is actually the very most basic form, I think. So um, certainly mem many of the participants have, are uh, definitely more master at crochet than I am. I've done a lot of it, but it's kind of the same thing that I do over and over without getting into um, fancy patterns or uh, anything of, and, and trying to make something that would actually be wearable. <laughs> um, but, uh, and also there has been, a, um, I've learned so much about uh, recycling and uh, the evidence of plastic and my eyes are open in a different way than they were before the project. And so it really feels like, you know, we feed each other and I, we've talked about um, putting together a list of uh, things like actionable points that we can do to reduce plastic in our, um, uh, our own lives, daily lives. I know I learned um, just off the top of my head, I learned that tea bags contain plastic from one of the participants. And I, you know, sure enough, came home and Googled it. And, and yeah, it's really like, uh, it's incredible to think like all of the different, the many different ways that uh, it's, you know, seeped into our environment. I also went to the microplastics movie that was sponsored by the green team. And, um, and that, you know, opened my eyes to an, another um, element, a few different elements of really like frightening ways in which the industry is kind of taken hold and when won't let go, you know, because they'll lose their revenues and, and they might have to change their ways. So it's really, um, it's been amazing for me to step up and be educated. <laughs> Yeah, building on that, the New York Times uh, had a report recently that during the pandemic, the plastic bag making uh, uh, industry is lobbying to bring back plastic bags that have been banned and claiming that there's a health danger for people to use their, their own bags. So even an issue that it seemed like was kind of resolved and people were on board with, which is banning single use plastic bags, there's been a definite um, fight back from the industry. Yeah, they see an opportunity. So um, can we talk a little bit then now about the components that people have been making for you? We've been having workshops, you've been teaching a few different shapes. What, what have people been producing? Um, so people have produced, um, so I have the samples here if you want to look. Yeah, <laughs> um, a beginner square um, piece that um, it, so I think you can use it as like a tunnel form like this a tube, um, which is another component that I am asking for. And also I'm thinking I would use it as a um, blossom shape, something like, whoops, something like this. These uh -huh. are coming um, in a bunch of different colors and We'll use them, you know, in different ways, probably probably sorted by colors or groups of colors. Um, and I want to mention that this is, where's the imperfect side? <laughs> it's not exactly perfect. You can see that edge is kind of rough, like a beginner made it. And that is not a problem at all. So, um, you know, this getting involved in the project is very easy and forgiving. And uh, you might think, you know, what if it's not as nice or the same size as my neighbors, but um, all of that is fine. I would think that actually that's uh, almost a benefit because what we're doing here is we're echoing natural forms and in nature things are not necessarily perfect. I mean, it gives it a more organic feeling. Right, absolutely. So that's the square and then are there other three-dimensional yeah. shapes that people are making? 
So I would say the next uh, easiest in level of difficulty, the beginner square, and then this tube component where it's crocheted in a circle. And um, so then the form builds up. And then I, that I'm having uh, the participants close off the end, which I think of as like a sucker or um, a valve that you might see in an aquatic form. Um, so those are coming in the orange or brown or orangey brown. <laughs> um, and I think a couple other colors as well. And then um, the next component is the little, the small green cup. Um, so these I'm thinking will be added together. So, you know, here's one, but if you think of them grouped together in a whole um, grouping. So I have, I'm asking for the cup in the small size and also in a larger size, like a blue cup shape. So then these will be uh, added together and, you know, just think of a grapes or something like that, that it's packed together um, that way. And then the last component we're asking people to make is this um, finger funnel shape. And uh, so they come, these I actually think were made by the same person. So they're all very similar sized, um, but some of them are much larger than this. Um, and so I think of these as like tentacles or um, cilia that you might see in uh, under a microscope. And so they will be um, added to the exterior. I do have actually a really large one here that uh, one of the super participants oh. made. <laughs> uh, oh this person is, you know, really adept at crochet and um, really interested in the project and has asked for special assignments. So I'll think of this piece as a, like a base piece and all of these um, smaller pieces as adornments for something like that. How many bags do you think have gone into uh, a large piece like that giant oh. blue? Uh, well, I'm guessing that the small, the hat is 20 to 25. So that's gotta be a couple hundred, wow. right? <laughs> yeah, at least. So the other thing that this um, project does is it gives us a kind of visualization of how many bags it, we were able to easily, easily collect. And most of them are newspaper subscription bags. Right. And, and actually, we've collected a lot more plastic than we're able to use for the project. But, you know, we bring that on to the DPW for recycling. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, easy. It is easy. Even though the plastic bags have been banned, the newspaper sleeves are not banned. And they are um, the ones that come in the, you know, nice, brighter colors. And that sort of brings up um, the next thing I wanted to talk about, which is that we designed this project to be able to use um, an abundant, inexpensive, not even inexpensive, a free abundant material, which is people's plastic bags that they don't want. They're looking to get rid of in a positive way. And so we've been collecting uh, plastic bags from all over Arlington and from adjoining towns. I, I, uh, my neighbors have been collecting their newspaper bags for me. Um, and we've almost created something that is uh, the perfect opposite of how you have to behave during a contagious um, epidemic, a pandemic, in that we're collecting bags, we have gatherings where people meet and sort through the bags by color, by size, and then they cut up the bags into loops. They, the same person may loop the loops together or they may give the loops to someone else to loop into Plarn. Um, some people don't really want to learn how to crochet, so they are just winding up um, the plarn that they've made into a ball and then that's given to someone else to crochet with. So the plastic is making the rounds um, with, our, with our group. So immediately, as soon as uh, it became apparent how serious um, the coronavirus was going to be uh, and our main host, the Arlington Library, closed down and Arlington has been very proactive about 
um, protecting its citizens by closing down the libraries, closing down public gatherings, closing down the school system, and we also closed down. So um, we're not able anymore to share materials in the way that we could, and we're not able to uh, gather for meetups and workshops. What, I guess my question really is sort of what has it been like to, to deal with that, to be um, managing this fantastic community collaboration and then have to shut it down? Well, it has been a tricky, um, you know, we had quite a lot scheduled for March and April. Um, and, uh, but like everyone else, we have just had to kind of switch gears. Um, I did have a lot of plastic that I have collected from over the years for my own work um, that I was able to feel was completely virus free and able to pass out and use for um, anyone who wanted to participate at home at this time. Um, and yeah, so we've been trying to, you know, create videos and uh, the Facebook page and find new ways like everyone is at this time to find new ways to connect and, um, and continue to uh, produce and feel productive and uh, engage with community and uh, you know, people at large. <laughs> yeah, and I think we've definitely been hearing back from people from the email correspondence. Mostly we've been doing email, although we hope to do some group calls, but it's interesting the range of reactions. For some people, they're just like, I have enough going on. I'm homeschooling my kids. I'm cooking every meal. I need to put the project on hold. It's a fabulous project, but I need to, to check out. And other people, it seems like they're like, yes, please, can you do another door-to-door -door delivery of some of that pre-virus uh, plastic bags so I can keep going? Yeah, I can. I mean, there definitely is a wide range and, and I feel it myself, you know, and and day to day is very different as well. I, I have children at home, not older children, but managing having four people in the house at all the time is is a challenge um and so yeah i understand the restraints on people but but i do feel there's room and and uh you know some i have talked to people who are very thankful to have the project to engage with so yeah yeah it'll be interesting to look back on this time and um for people to share their their experiences because I think all of us are juggling. There's a practical logistical side of homeschooling or cooking or um, running errands in a different way, but there's definitely an emotional toll. Uh, I experience days where I don't seem to get anything done and then days that I'm very productive. Has that been challenging for you as the um, artist who's leading this project and you know, developing a vision for the final piece. How, how, has, how have you been able to continue your creative process in this period? Um, it, it is a challenge. I do, I feel most days are relatively productive. I definitely have had days where it just feels like the wheels are spinning. Um, but I think as, as we get further into this, I know we're all tired of it, but but there is sort of a um, a flow. A flow can be tapped into, um, and you know, as an artist, I think we're we tend to be alone a lot of the time, and you know, be able to manage and say, okay, that's studio time, you know. So, I think uh, I'm still most of the time able to focus and engage. <laughs> And when everything is uh, installed in whatever way, whatever form that ends up taking, uh, what are you hoping the impact on people who are walking or biking on the, on the Minuteman? Thousands of people every day use the Minuteman when things are back to normal. Um, what, what impact do you want the piece to have? Well, I hope that people will, uh, you know, my work tends to have a like twofold, you know, it's like, oh, wow, cool, bright things. And then you realize what they're made of. And it's kind of like, you know, bam, 
that's a lot of plastic and a lot of work and you know time and effort and and uh, a lot of things went into this and uh, you know this material that is sort of um, terrible and you know choking things out so um, I hope that it will inspire people to think more about their use of plastic we're hoping to have some um, you know some supporting facts about plastic use and plastic waste um, al along with the uh, installation on the bike path so um, I, I hope it will be sort of opening I know this this community is already pretty aware um, of all of these things so I don't but but there must be people who are using that path that will be will hopefully think again you know yeah plus I think we all slip sometimes and and we need a reminder I, uh, it's easy to say oh just this once I'll opt for the thing that's convenient um, so. right even the most enlightened people need a reminder and reinforcement and inspiration. Yeah, well, what we really need is, um, you know, su support from higher, like at the moment, it's kind of planned for us to waste, you know, use single use plastics and it's planned obsolescence. And what we really need is from the beginning, a better, less, but better. Right, there's actually a, um, a an, uh, one of Arlington's um, congressional representatives has drafted a bill to try to deal with plastics at the beginning, you know, to, and to make the people who are manufacturing plastic more responsible for the waste. So in a way, this project could end up getting people involved in um, advocating for legislation that will um, address the, the industry and, and not, not make this a private problem that, oh, if I could just recycle my trash properly, that would take care of it. But more think about how we as a community and as, a, um, as people who vote, how we can uh, transform the whole system that allows this pervasive plastic to enter our lives and the environment. Right, absolutely. I feel like, uh, you know, I, I'm not an angel in terms of plastic, but uh, I do my best and I do look for ways to cut down more. But even when I'm thinking, uh, you know, I'm walking the line and reducing and being as uh, environmentally friendly as I can, I know that like science, you know, uses a lot of plastic and there's no way to recycle all those pieces so it's just it's just not set up for uh the planet you know for the health of our planet um before we close is there anything that you'd like to add is there anything else you feel we haven't covered that you'd like to say uh well i'm really grateful for um for having this project to work on during this time, but also for, for meeting all these wonderful people in Arlington and, and for the reception that I've had there. Um, I really, it's been very special. And for me, I think, um, you know, I have just these two little hands. So it's been a, it's given me a way to kind of think wider and expand, think bigger about my own practice, um, which, you know, uh, I, I think when you first said, oh, we have these people, they'll be, we'll, you know, we have volunteers who will crochet for you. And I thought, uh, <laughs> I can't imagine it. But <laughs> here, you were so right. It's so true. And, and uh, they've all given so much. And, and I'm really grateful for all of that. And I think it's going to be a great installment on the bike path. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. And um, I'll just say now that if people are still wanting to get engaged in the project, it's still possible. Um, you can send an email to plarnartplanet at gmail.com 
and I will get your message and I can answer you with um, how to best get involved. We're developing a resource area on our website, which is artsarlington.org slash residency. And we'll be posting videos there that take you through the different forms that you can make. Uh, and finally, we also have a um, presence in social media on Facebook. It's uh, Arts Arlington Creates, and that's a place where you can see pictures posted of the things that people have made or um, post your own pictures, cheer us on, um, check in on the project. So we'd love to have uh, you be engaged that way. Thank you. Thank you, Cecily.